Imagine a game that could be played forever with no ending in sight. That's what Thyrosin Studios attempted to create with their first game, Cyrulim. This niche series of monster-taming RPGs has been running for a few years now, starting in 2015 and then spawning three sequels and a spin-off. The story is that your father was the ruler of the Kingdom of Cyrulim, but he's kind of dead now and the responsibility falls on your shoulders. Your job is to build up Cyrulim's economy and reputation by building an army, exploring other realms for treasure, and brutalizing anyone who questions your authority. Oof. And that's it. You get bits of lore here and there, but Cyrulim doesn't have a structured story of any sort. You're not going out to defeat some ancient evil or to find a legendary dinkly-doo of Ultimate Destiny. At the core of its gameplay is a procedurally generated series of dungeons that scale infinitely. It's all about making your numbers more numberier, so the ending only comes when you want it to come. You begin by picking a name, gender and one of five mage classes, each proficient with one of the game's five elements. Each class has a different appearance, a different starter creature and a set of unique skills. With that, you're dropped into the castle and greeted by one of your retainers, who will give you tutorials as you progress and unlock new things. And by progress I mean leveling up, because upgrades are gated behind the player's level, and again the story is rather non-existent. The game has two main parts, castle management and realm exploration. The castle of Cyrulim houses various facilities that you unlock and upgrade as you play the game. Many of them will require you to perform a ritual, which charges up by simply winning battles. Rituals also require a set number of resources. These are brimstone, crystal, essence, granite and power, and they can be acquired through many different methods. The War Room is where you can find the Teleportation Shrine, which will take you to a fully randomized realm. You can think of them as the floors of a dungeon. There are several different types, from Happy Day Forest to Wedgie Skalorgi, and the deeper you go, the better the rewards and the tougher the challenges. Realms are filled with many random objects and NPCs that you can interact with. Some give you stuff, some ask you to do something, and some are filthy gambling dwarves. Every realm also gives you an optional task that you should try to complete, since it awards you a bunch of experience and a royalty point that can be used to acquire permanent bonuses. You can also create a two-way portal back to Cyrulim at any time, in case you want to manage your items or party. But realms are populated by a set number of enemy parties, and failure to keep socially distancing will trigger a battle. Victory awards you items, resources, and also experience points to level up both yourself and your creatures. By default, your party also fully recovers between battles, so don't be afraid to experiment with suicidal dickhead strategies. But if you want extra pain, you can always enable permadeath when starting a new game. The player doesn't directly participate in combat, but will still earn experience points and grow in level, increasing spell power and making spells more effective. Each level up also grants you some royalty points that can be spent on perks that provide you with permanent bonuses. All mage classes share the same basic perks, but the third category has five perks unique to each one. Victory also increases your power balance, which starts at 100 but can rise up to 200 by default, and the higher it is the better the rewards. But defeat will drop it by 30%, together with a one-way ticket back to the castle. The final facility you unlock is the arena, which is as close to endgame content as it gets. Entering it requires a rare ticket, and it challenges you to survive as many battles in a row as you can. The longer you survive, the more arena points you get, which can then be spent on a shop that sells rare stuff. But here, your party does not recover between battles, so having a way to heal is much more important. 
before each round, you can stop your streak and take your currently accumulated points home, while getting defeated will result in only earning half of the points you had. That's the basics of the gameplay loop, but behind it is 50 gazillion variables ready to punt you in the face. On the top floor of the castle is the Spell Chamber, where you can summon new creatures to join your party, such as dragons, golems and... Master Chief. Summoning requires some resources and three cores of the desired creature. These are acquired by performing an extraction on them during combat. Any of your party members can do it, and the more damaged the target is, the higher the chance of successfully extracting a core. Each creature has its own set of base stats and belongs to one of the game's five elements. Cyrulim is balanced so that all creatures are meant to be fireable, and it's unusual in that none of the elements themselves are strong or weak against another. Instead, creatures have five separate defense values, and any weaknesses can be made up for with the right equipment. The most important bit is each creature's unique ability, which will trigger automatically when the conditions are fulfilled. You can have six creatures with you at once, and mixing the right abilities is necessary if you want to go far. Also important is the blacksmith and the enchanter, which lets you create powerful artifacts that your creatures can equip. Artifacts can be acquired in multiple ways, such as forging your own in exchange for brimstone and crystal. Their basic stats will scale with the player's level, but by using them to murderize enemies they will also grow in level and unlock enchantment slots. You can then add new effects to the artifact in exchange for resources and crafting materials. Basic enchantments are instant, but the most powerful ones will require their own ritual. The initial stats are random, but you can reroll them as many times as you want for a bit of brimstone, and they scale within a certain range based on the player's level. So you should pay the blacksmith a visit every once in a while to power up your artifacts. The spell chamber also has two major upgrades. One is the Goblet of Power that lets you perform rituals to summon a random selection of items, and the other is part of a very lengthy process that lets you acquire nether creatures that are much more powerful than their regular counterparts, but will require a lot more experience points to grow. It involves performing several rituals to activate nether orbs, which then require you to place gems in it, and these gems also range from level 1 to 10, and also require their own rituals to enchant with one of 5 bonuses. The reward for all this is massive stat boosts, based on what gems were placed into the nether orb. Okay, this is all cool and stuff, but I haven't gotten to the combat yet. And that's because battles themselves are very simple. Each participant acts in order based on their speed stat. Each turn creatures can perform a basic attack, half damage until the next turn by defending, or they can provoke the enemy party and cause them to target that creature, but this also reduces its defense by 50%. You can also attempt to escape the battle or to cast a spell with any of your equipped spell gems. There are a ton of them to discover, but keep in mind that on top of their mana cost, they also have limited charges, and once exhausted, the gem is lost. Because your party's health and mana are fully recovered between battles, they are balanced around your party being in perfect condition. So to avoid dragging them out for too long, all creatures become exhausted and take more damage after a certain number of turns have passed. Experience points also scale based on the creature's level, so fresh new party members will quickly catch up. Every creature in your party will still earn experience points even if they're dead too, which is useful because the AI has the tendency to gangbang your party's weakest link. 
This incentivizes the player to experiment with different creatures, which is good because the depth comes almost entirely from watching all of the mechanics interact with one another. That's why abilities tend to have pretty significant effects. Cyrilim's creatures don't have any active skills of their own, so combat is less about picking the right moves each turn and more about making sure you've built up a strong enough party, with powerful artifacts and useful abilities that complement each other. I'm talking about crazy builds like using a creature that gets double attack bonus from its equipped artifact, which has a ton of attack and speed bonuses in it, and pairing it with another creature that lets it deal a portion of its massive damage to surrounding enemies as well. And then also having a different creature with an artifact enchanted with an ability that causes your creatures to gain 30% attack power every time an enemy dies, reaching ridiculous damage multipliers that annihilate any remaining enemies that didn't get obliterated in the first turn. If this kind of silliness appeals to you, then congratulations, Cyrilim might be the game for you. But this dependency on abilities is also why combat can get pretty friggin' dull. Cyrilim is more about the preparation than the execution, but it's like 90% preparation and 10% execution. Since abilities all trigger automatically, combat is basically on autopilot most of the time. Sure, your creatures can also defend and provoke, but preservation isn't so important when the party fully recovers after each battle, and provoke also requires specific creatures to get any proper use from it, due to the heavy defense penalty. Casting spells is at least something, but due to the game's random nature you can't afford to waste the precious few spells that are actually useful in the long term. There are items and random events that let you restore charges, but they are quite rare and expensive too. I imagine most people are going to start getting tired of the gameplay somewhere around player level 50, since that's when you stop unlocking new and exciting stuff and the upgrades become simply unlocking more creatures or improving the existing facilities. The gameplay begins to lose its luster, as the infinite scaling goes from being engaging to making everything feel a bit pointless. To be fair, this isn't a problem specific to Cyrilim, and getting to the point where the scaling goes full retard takes a long time. It's just something that comes with the very concept of never-ending stat bloat. Level scaling is one of the oldest and most complicated dilemmas of video game design, and it requires a very well thought out implementation to get a good result. Stuff like action and racing games are almost entirely built around motor reflexes, so they don't have this problem. It's all about properly controlling the player avatar. Want to be a better player? Then start by getting good, you scrub. It's different for games built around stats. Generally, there is some other form of strategy involved like party composition or character positioning, but a large part of it simply involves getting your numbers more numberier than the enemy. The problem comes when enemies grow in power at the same rate as the player, which could result in a situation where you don't feel stronger than you did at the beginning. The way the scaling works in Cyrilim is that Realm Level 1 has enemies that are two levels lower than the player, and with every consecutive realm, the levels of enemies increases by one. So by Realm Level 3, you're already getting matched against enemies on the same power level as you. The game attempts to avoid these problems by giving the player permanent bonuses that enemies don't have access to, some of which even scale infinitely. But that's only some of them, and inevitably there will be a point when the amount of experience points and royalty points needed for leveling up just gets way too grindy to be fun by any human metric. So yes, the developers did create a game that can be played forever, but only in the most literal sense. Which is an obvious observation, and you didn't need this whole video to figure it out, but still. 
Regardless of its gameplay design, Cyrilim also has a bit of a problem with the way in which information is presented, and I imagine that it will put some people off going any further into what is otherwise a pretty addicting game. The interface is a giant mess with a serious case of information overload. Cyrilim has a ton of creatures with unique abilities, and tons of spells, status effects, perks, items and artifact bonuses. Every menu, every text box, every status screen dumps countless terms on the player without an easy way to learn about them, and as a result it can be very confusing at the start. There's a library that is full of unlabeled bookcases that explains many parts of the game, such as ability descriptions, or how certain mechanics work in detail. But want to know what that ability that you're about to enchant an artifact with does? Too bad, stop the process and get your ass over to the library. Battle events are presented almost entirely in plain text, without things like damage numbers or icons for status effects. Normal stuff that you take for granted in other games. This makes it hard to quickly parse what's going on, especially when you set the speed to turbo, which disables the flashes that indicate what enemy is being hit. And you will want to use turbo speed, because otherwise battles are rather slow. There's also a few quirks like how you have to equip artifacts from the item menu, but to unequip them you have to go to the monster's status screen. Enchantments also only appear on the enchantment screen if you have the necessary materials for it, and perks are organized alphabetically rather than sorting them by the category of bonus they provide. Maybe this all comes off as nonsensical nitpicky bollocks, especially since you're watching a highly edited video on YouTube with a script written by some nerd with spicy hot takes. But I assure you that it's something that you notice while playing, consciously or subconsciously. Other annoyances include the map screen being… whatever this is, and some unlocking conditions being completely randomized. This is mainly a problem with a merchant called Binine, which you can recruit to your castle and will trade you rare stuff in exchange for exalted emblems. Two of the things you can get from this randomly found NPC include a very convenient item that doubles your movement speed, and cores to summon a creature that greatly increases the amount of resources you get from battles, cutting down on the grinding tremendously. It's particularly useful for not running out of granite and only granite all the time, since a lot of important upgrades use a ton of it. Then again, I'm not sure this feedback is going to be of any real use at this point, because from a couple of hours I've played, Zero Vim 2 seems to have already fixed many of the problems I have with this game. It has a story with objectives that give you something to work towards, the battle interface is a lot more readable thanks to its better visual feedback, and instead of automatically scaling to the player's level, enemy strength is based solely on the realm level. The general opinion also seems to be that newcomers can just jump ahead to Zero Vim Ultimate since it's better in every way. This leaves me in an awkward position where I think that Zero Vim is flawed, but interesting in its own right, while also not being sure if there's much reason to play it when Zero Vim 2 seems to be a much refined version of it. Truly a first world problem. But for all its flaws, I did enjoy playing Zero Vim 1. It's a game for people who love the grind of constantly becoming more powerful, and exploiting the game's mechanics to their fullest in order to become unstoppable. It's a passion project aimed at a very specific audience, and I can respect it for that.